I'll just press the buttons. OK, great. <laughs> OK, hi, everybody. Um, is, this, is this thing working? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Eckert. I'm a software engineer who works on FBOSS at Facebook. And I'm here to talk about all the software work that went into making F16 and Minipack a reality. <clears throat> so you've already heard from Alexi about F16, the next generation of our data center network topologies. And you've heard from Shu about the hardware components that will constitute them. Our job on the software team is to provide the glue between this vision and the individual building blocks in order to operate our massive data center networks. So what software is required to operate a network at this scale? At a minimum, you need management plane software, meaning the ability, ability to deploy, configure, and monitor the health of your network and the devices in it. But at Facebook, most of our time is going deeper than that. We write our own control and routing protocols um, that we need at different layers of our fabric network. We interface directly with the switching ASIC in order to control the data plane the way we want. And then we work closely with the hardware team to design, build, and write the drivers for all the low-level components that make up our hardware platforms. Most of this presentation is going to focus on the software that runs inside of a given box, but that should not discount all of the work beyond that that went into making F16 happen. So diving into an individual switch, the software we run on our switches uh, in our data center we call FBOSS. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, this stands for the Facebook Open Switching System. And it's a project we started about five years ago with a 16 by 40 gig rack switch named Wedge. Uh, this is a block diagram you may have seen before. Uh, we're now in our fifth generation of devices, but many of the hardware components have stayed the same. Or many of the software components have stayed the same. So you start with the hardware platform, which is expected to have an OCP microserver, a switching ASIC, and a board management controller. This is the switching unit she referred to in the last presentation. Then you load the standard operating system kernel and other system libraries we run on all control planes in the Facebook fleet. And FBUS itself is really then just a set of applications. The FBUS agent is responsible for programming the ASIC and, ma and managing the control planes we run on the, in the network. We add in BGP as a routing daemon to exchange paths, and we have OpenBMC to manage power, fans, and out-of-band access. So this has been the baseline for all of our work the last five years, but with each new hardware platform, we introduced something a little bit new. So with Sixpack, we scaled our software to support running at a more sensitive layer of our fabric network. With Wedge 100, we onboarded a new switching ASIC and, and had to support some nascent 100 gig optic technology at massive scale. With Backpack, we entered the fabric switch tier in mass and gained experience on how you can operate a modular, modular switch with 12 independent control planes. We created a variant of Wedge 100 with a more secure microsystem, microserver, and a trusted platform module. And then we took those switches, jammed a bunch of them into a rack, and enable building switches of arbitrary sizes from smaller reusable building blocks, which we use for our fabric aggregators. Which finally brings us to Minipack, which introduces its own set of challenges. First, it is a modular switch, but with a single control plane. In some ways, this is much simpler. Alexi alluded to this in his first presentation. But the software on the box is actually much more complicated. We need, because we need to support these different PIM types and also different port speeds within a certain PIM. It's the first platform we need to support programming external FIs. We needed to have drivers for I2C and MDIO to talk to our optics and, and these FIs. And we had to run with this new FPGA implementation in order to accelerate these two protocols to support 128 ports. We have our new microserver, which Hal went into, called MiniLake. And we have a new switching ASIC, the Tomahawk 3 from Broadcom. Additionally, there's a challenge about cooling. This was also alluded to earlier, but 128 optics in only 4RU is quite challenging. So we needed to write some sophisticated fan control algorithms on OpenBMC. On top of that, in order to reduce risk we, and, and have an additional supplier for our network, we targeted running FBUS on Arista hardware, the 7368 platform which has its own set of challenges. The main one is that this is the first time we've operated FBOSS on non-Facebook-designed hardware. 
On top of that, it has different hardware components, different external file vendor, different FPGA implementation. The microserver is also a bit unfamiliar to us, and critically, it didn't have an off-the-shelf UEFI BIOS, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Operationally, we need to be able to manage these devices either as FBOS devices or in EOS mode. And converting between these two software stacks is a complicated procedure. So I just threw a lot of terminology at you and listed out a bunch of things. But what I really want to highlight is the number of combinations we need to support. We have two variations of the same Radix switch, each with their own hardware components. Each of these switches is modular and could have different types of pins plugged in. There's th these, mo these devices could be dropped at one of three layers in our fabric networks. And we want to run the same binary that we run on all of the hardware platforms I introduced at the beginning of this presentation on these new devices. So this sheer amount of variation was really the, big, the biggest challenge that we had to overcome in order to validate that our stack was ready for F16. So how did we tackle this? The first way is through trying to build up some common abstractions wherever possible. While these two platforms, Arista and Facebook Minipack, certainly have differences, their capabilities are basically identical. So our job is to abstract away these differences so that running, uh, so we can run the same software stack throughout our data center. We want to run the same kernel and operating system. We want to manage the data plane and control plane using FBOS, and we want to manage the board using OpenBMC. So if we do our job well, the hardware differences should not be pronounced and we should be able to drop these boxes at any layer of the network. Of course, this is easier said than done. So the first, we, needed, we had two completely new microservers. Um, and we needed to plug these microservers into Facebook's server provisioning infrastructure. So on Minipack, this was the new Minilake control module. And how talked about this before, and this was managed in parallel to the Minipack project. Uh, from the software side, though, this was actually not a huge departure from what we were used to. Our ODM provided us the microserver with the necessary components that we asked for. Our job was to test and verify that it worked and we could provision the devices. On the software side, we're also very excited about this new, kind of more powerful server to play around with. The real challenge was actually on the Arista boxes. So Arista has historically been shipped with a custom core boot rather than an off-the-shelf UEFI BIOS while our servers and switches have historically been shipped with UFI. So we had to reconcile some of these differences and come up with a plan to meet the requirements. And we decided to use this program to pilot our implementation of the OCP open system firmware. Uh, this consists of all open source firmware components um, like U-Root, Core Boot, Linux Boot, System Boot, maybe some others. <laughs> Um, as I'm sure many of you know, firmware bugs are never really fun to debug, and they're very tedious to track down. So our host provisioning team had wanted to try this for a while, as this was a great opportunity. Um, this, was, this whole project was a good step towards controlling our destiny even more through managing our firmware tool chain ourselves like we do our hardware platforms and switching uh, software. So the other significant challenge was the conversion process itself. So Arista ships us the boxes running EOS, and it's our job to convert some of them to FBOS. This process what involves what they call a full personality change of the box. In EOS mode, the microserver is in charge of controlling power, fans, and other onboard components. In FBOS mode, we want OpenBMC to take charge of all of that, which is more in line with how we manage other servers in the fleet. The conversion itself is a bit of a song and dance between EOS, the stored OpenBMC version, the OCP open system firmware payload, and our conversion scripts. But by working closely with Arista, we're able to harden this process, and we have a few boxes converting back and forth with a pretty regular cadence to avoid no re regressions. So we finally got a Facebook image booted now. Now we have to support the modularity of this platform. So going back to the diagram I showed you at the beginning of what FBOS looks like, the components in the top half are largely untouched, but the bottom half has gotten much more complicated. The main elements that we need to program are the external FIs and the transceivers. Each component is going to have precise settings based on which port it is, the type of PIM that's plugged in, the, the speed we want to run it at. So Shu shared some better diagrams for this. 
But the end state we want is that 25 gig NRZ data is coming in through the transceivers, hitting the external FIs, being translated to 50 gig PAM4, and hitting the internal FIs of the Tomahawk 3. However, in order to, to program these devices, we first need to even be able to communicate with them. So for transceivers, the onboard protocol is I squared C. And our transceiver management and monitoring software all runs on our Mini Lake microserver. Uh, this was also alluded to, but historically we communicated with these transceivers through a USB to I squared C bridge chip that turned into a single I squared C bus. But one I squared C bus to 128 optics was not going to cut it. So in order to scale, we developed our own FPGA implementation. This included some pretty standard I squared C controller blocks, but also a pretty advanced procedure to background fetch the transceiver data pages of interest and then cache them at the IOB FPGA. This gives us maximal freshness of the data, and when we need it, we only need to go hit the IOB FPGA layer. I also talked a bit about some of the cooling challenges, and in order to solve this, OpenBMC wanted to know the temperature of all the optics on the board. So having this cache enabled us to share this data between these two components without contending for I2C resources. Next, we have the external FIs. These speak MDIO instead of I2C, so we utilized MDIO controllers in our FPGA. Uh, on FBOS, we had never needed to speak MDIO before, so we needed to write some drivers to fit into our code, as well as the chip SDKs. Um, and as well as an inter implementation of the interface in order to speak it through this IOB FPGA. And then rem remember that we have two hardware platforms here with different FPGAs, so a lot of this work had to be done twice. So now that we can talk to the FI, we need to actually program them. And so when we started the project, I really didn't have any idea what these things were, so I'll kind of give a brief overview of what you need to know on the software side in order to program them, especially as someone without a very strong understanding of L1 concepts. So here's an abstraction of what the Broadcom 81724 switch look, chip looks like. Uh, this is on our PIM 16Q PIM cards. So there are two sides of the chip. There's a system side, which faces the ASIC, and the line side, which faces the transceivers. The first thing you need to do on startup is load a custom firmware onto this chip, and we choose to do that on in-band in from the microserver so we have complete control. This becomes important when we try to implement things like graceful and hitless software upgrades uh, without disrupting traffic. And the primary configuration we want to support is to take two system side lanes running at 50 gig PAM4 and translate them to four line side lanes running at 20, 25 gig NRZ to create a single 100 gig port. This was covered by Shu, but this is the entire purpose of these chips. We want to connect our hardened optics to this new modern chip. Um, if you're running the chip at 40 gig, the mapping stays the same, but it goes from 2 by 20 to 4 by 10. It gets more complicated at 200 gig. In this case, we take four lanes on the system side, just run the, switch, run the chip as a read timer to four lanes on, on the line side at 50 gig of both sides. Um, the effect of this, though, is that the neighboring transceiver cannot be used because we've effectively stolen its system side lanes. So on top of setting this port map, each of these lanes has precise settings that need to be programmed depending on which port it is, the speed, and the chip. Um, so much of our time validating this platform was finding the correct values for these settings in order to get a good eye on all the ports. So ultimately, this turned into a bit of a state management problem for us. But in an area of our code base that had historically been pretty ad hoc. Our normal state management mechanism is a copy and write tree of an abstracted switch configuration. So it's optimized for a high number of readers and a low number of writers. We copy the nodes on the tree that needs to change when something, when a change comes in. Um, the downside of this is that this lives at a layer of the software stack that thinks of itself as an abstracted switch without knowledge of the hardware or board specific platform. So these changes are communicated down to our hardware switch implementation through a state update queue, and that hardware switch implementation affects this change in the ASIC by looking at the delta. You may have seen something like this in a past presentation on FBOS. What we don't normally show is that there's a third major component involved here, which we call the platform. And this is responsible for implementing all board-specific functionality, 
and it answers questions like, what is the port map? How do I speak I squared C or MDIO? There are also objects we call platform ports, which are responsible for specific logic like, like port bring up or how to toggle an LED that corresponds to a given port. So how do we solve this? And this is still a work in progress, but the solution we came up with is to create a more structured configuration around our platform. I was initially thinking we would just fold this into our switch state tree, but that feels wrong from a layering perspective. So consider changing a 40 gig port to a 200 gig port at runtime. We would need to remap all the external file lanes, change all the tuning settings on the system side and line side, and then somehow also communicate that our neighbor port is unusable and reject invalid configurations that come in. Putting this into the switch state tree would just kind of be shifting the problem somewhere else. So what we ultimately did is we modeled our configuration as nothing too advanced, but a map from the speed to all these specific port settings. Uh, when a port change comes in, the platform will notice this, and the platform port will be responsible for taking this, these settings and affecting them in the transceivers and the external files. Uh, it's a bit early to declare this a success, but it does hide a lot of the complexity from the software switch, and we can still have software that looks like change this port to 40 gig, change this port to 200 gig. So the other answer to the question of how to handle this variation is through testing. So obviously we've tested past platforms, but we usually have our, a new hardware coming in that's targeted at a specific tier of the network. Um, this was definitely not the case here, so we had to rethink our strategy. And we realized at the beginning of the project that we needed to change what we were doing. So the few main strategies we employed were to first create some targeted tests in our lab environment that emulate the full F16 topology, deploy our switches early to production to get experience operating the device, and to invest heavily in testing automation. The first challenge was how do you take these massive diagrams, uh, massive networks, and condense them into a realistic lab topology? So we spent a lot of time designing a scaled down F16. We utilized parallel links so we could test things like traffic hashing and ECMP shrink and expand, and we used an Ixia to pump additional peerings and high route scale. Uh, so I already mentioned all of the combinations we needed to support, and we had pretty limited lab resources. We basically had two labs involved. And the approach we took was to set up a kind of uh, conveyor belt of sorts where we would be testing one device or layer in one lab, refreshing the hardware in the other, alternating back and forth until we could finally get all of the targets tested. So this was a huge amount of effort as new hardware revisions came in, but when we were confident enough in a certain combination, we would move as early as possible into production testing. So early deployment has been a philosophy of our team and really Facebook engineering as a whole for a long time. And we found that there isn't really a good substitute for this, and that's especially true for all the systems that work around the switch, the provisioning tools, the monitoring tools, emulating production in a lab is quite difficult for those. Ultimately, we end up discovering issues in both the on-switch software and the network tool chain we need to operate it inside of our networks. And in the end, we're not just developing this isolated platform, we want it to fit into our tool chain on day one with all the monitoring that we expect it to support, and we're developing a fully ready-to-deploy ready to switching system. Lastly, we invested in test automation. The first challenge was taking all of the testing that was traditionally done by our data center networking team in labs and automating it. Um, historically, this has been very manual, and automating it allowed us to get these tests running at a somewhat regular cadence while we could turn our focus to some new combination that required some new feature work. We also began developing more targeted ASIC data plane testing. So this was not intended specifically for Minipack, but rather to ensure that we don't regress when we introduce changes that affect five hardware platforms at the same time. Uh, these tests will focus on the lowest layers of our software stack, and unit testing this layer has traditionally been pretty difficult. At the abstract switch layer, it's not too hard to create some unit tests, but when you start getting closer and closer to hardware, you really wanna see how it actually behaves. So this, the strategy we took was to write things that look as close as possible to unit tests. We're writing a, testing a specific functionality, but running it on actual hardware, um, this allows us to repro problems and work with our partners faster, and then also to 
verify the behavior and the chip behaves the way we expect. We then plug these targeted tests into our common Facebook testing infrastructure, and this provides us with good on-diff signal for when a developer might have broken an old platform or, or a new platform with something we're working on. So together, we're aiming to use these strategies more and more, and we believe this will allow us to introduce new hardware platforms uh, to production even faster. So some takeaways from this presentation. First is that Minipack is a powerful modular building block for our switches. And software support for this modularity has its challenges, which I try to convey in some of this presentation. And while this is always an iterative process, we were able to overcome these by rethinking some of our designs and then investing heavily in early deployment and testing automation. So thank you. Questions for uh, for Alex and, and actually any of the team. Uh, Alexi is still here. I see Shu is still here. Uh, so any of the presentations about F16, Minipack, um, you know, the, either the hardware, the network, or the software. Yeah. So it, it looks like uh, Alex and team have a extra work to have two sandbox, one Arista and one Minipack. So question to Amar and the team. And uh, it seems that the hardware team is not fully trusted. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Sorry. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my question is, uh, what's the consideration behind it? And uh, are you going to, like, when you deploy, you're going to mix those two, two vendors? And uh, who is the backup? And uh, what, what's the story behind it? Take that one. <laughs> well, we just needed to. So the question is, what are the roles of uh, different mini pack flavors? And what is the primary, what is the backup? Or? Yes. Yeah, so pretty much the volume of platforms, of, of the instances uh, that we're deploying is very large. And um, we're always trying to uh, develop safeties for, for the supply chain. Uh, so yes, it is challenging to work with different uh, gearboxes. Yes, it is challenging to work with different microservers, but they're different. They don't fail the same way. Uh, uh, they complement each other. Uh, we have uh, theoretically full interchangeability anywhere on the network. So we can, we can build uh, the F16s, we can build age grids of any components uh, from, uh, from this uh, set. Uh, but on practice, we target certain network layers uh, with a given type of component. So just balancing the load of how many boxes of each type uh, goes on the network where. But uh, philosophically, this is just a convenience like to structure it, but philosophically, we support full interchangeability, and we designed everything for full interchangeability. Mm -hmm. We just consider it like A, B variants of the same platform. OK. Gotcha. Thank you. Question? Hi. Uh, so I kind of have two questions I'd like to, uh, to ask. The first is that, uh, so now it seems that it's uh, all the XJS uh, Tomahawk chips, uh, but uh, there's uh, still yet another line of chips that uh, d the Dune chips with deep buffers. So what's the consideration here? Is that uh, do you think that the, the deep buffer is still needed or not? The second is that uh, now the network topology is kind of a one over one over subscription, uh, which means that uh, actually it's uh, uh, from Network capacity point of view, it's a kind of flat um, network, right? Uh, if we do routing or load balancing correctly, right? But uh, <coughs> uh, in this case, is actually the, can the server actually um, use uh, the servers can use all the capacities that uh, you are providing? Uh, is this kind of an overshoot? Yeah, thanks. Um, so for the deep. I have this one. So for the deep buffer question, uh, certainly in our data centers, we have not needed that. And we like the, re the reliability we get from having predictable buffer sizes. Um, this, not to rule out, maybe we'll do it someday, but this is uh, not needed yet. But do you um, still, uh, sorry. sorry. Uh, I have a follow-up question. Sure. Is that do you still have this uh, many to one traffic uh, pattern? So basically, that's the you can still have, uh, you know, because, because that actually is uh, kind of not very related to 
the network topology, but uh, related to the, the service uh, traffic pattern, right? So that we will still have bursts in the yeah. network. We definitely have it, uh, but we design our services uh, and applications to be able to withstand that as well. Uh, so uh, we do load balancing on the network layer and we do load balancing on the service layer as well. Uh, so we are trying to avoid these situations uh, to, like, deep buffers is all great, but they have their own disadvantages, the latency variation and the power consumption. Uh, when we're talking scale, something uh, that's like more optimal in a small scale application, when you blow it up to a massive scale, all of this like extra 10 watt of power, extra 100 watt of power, or extra millisecond or microsecond of latency, all of this comes to play. Mm -hmm. So we're just trying to go simple and attack, like when we get a problem, when we get in cast, when we get some scenarios, we attack it from all possible ends, including the application. Yeah, yeah we have kind of an advantage that if like some application starts just completely messing with the network, we can go like talk to them and come up with a solution together. Um, and we'll work together to forecast what we need in the next two or four years so we can support it. Yeah, the, the other question is about like uh, racks being or servers being able to utilize uh, this uh, capacity. That's an interesting question because uh, as it stands right away, uh, not necessarily, uh, but we're not building the network for today. The network has a long life cycle. Uh, it uh, takes time to put in place. Then it takes time to run in production. Then it takes time to convert to the other things. During all this time, we are introducing the new services. So we are looking long term. Uh, we are looking on the services that we are developing, hardware that we are developing, that will appear on this network throughout the life cycle. Yeah. And the situations like what you are talking about with in-cast, with like, uh, various scenarios uh, when we need to absorb unexpected large amounts of traffic. Maybe we can move on to the some more other questions. Thanks. Hello. Uh, my question is: Was there a need of need for the lower speeds, like uh, two into fifty gig or four into twenty five gig? Do, do you do you support that actually? S sorry, so lower speed like forty gig or uh, forty gig, four into twenty five, yeah. and two into fifty. Do you support in this? So lowest we have right now is forty gig, but like. When we, when we present these things, it's kind of easy to think of it as a vacuum, like we're just dropping this massive network in place. But the challenge is kind of the transition period. So we need 40 gig because we still have a few 40 gig fabrics, right? We need like potentially mixed PIMs because maybe we'll be transitioning some to a newer, higher speed while others are still on the current speed. So we do have the need for this, for kind of these transition paths to make them smooth. Um, we haven't really found a need to go lower than 40. We, but it shouldn't be too hard to add. <laughs> yeah, and another question is like you had a new FPGA. So is it a PCI endpoint or is it an I2C endpoint? It's a PCI endpoint from, from the microserver. We're, we kind of load it into the operating system so it looks like we're doing memory accesses but they're turning into PCI read and write to the, to the FPGA. Okay, thanks. Thank you for the talk. A uh, question for Alexi. Um, you talked about top of rack up to spine traffic, you know, the 128 ports of 100 gig. What about if traffic leaves the region, you know, kind of through your back, backbone? Uh, we organize our application in such a way that, like, what leaves the region is relatively low amounts of replication or north-south okay. traffic. So the majority of communication between the applications happens within the region. So mm -hmm. that's where we are uh, really concerned about developing the capacity and developing the scalable technology. However, as you see with AgeGrid, with, with the like, UU tier that I demonstrated, that is greatly scalable too. That is scalable by itself to hundreds of terabits. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned that you don't do use deep uh, for uh, switches, but uh, how about the uh, traffic between uh, regions? It's just a follow up uh, from the previous question because. Uh, the, the latency between regions or even between continents is uh, quite high. So if you, without a deep buffer, how do you handle it? Maybe we can just take that offline. I mean, the deep buffer question, there's a presumption that deep buffers actually solve something. But we can take that question offline, you know, because that's a little bit unrelated to the, the data center dis discussion that we're having. But we're happy to talk about it offline. Yeah. Let's go to another question. The question is uh, about uh, availability. So you have uh, three flavors, um, the mini pack, and then Arista plus EOS, and Arista plus uh, FBOS. 
what is your deployment uh, schedule for the three different flavors? Uh, I don't know if we can talk about that one. Uh, I mean, it's pretty much everything everything's is going, going in going production. <laughs> <laughs> everything's going in production. Like there's that was the, the massive scale yeah. we're talking about. It's got everything's got to go out. Yeah. Pretty much there's uh, rolling out through all the regions as fast as possible. So all the flavors, all flavors are being yeah. tested. All flavors are being deployed. Uh, this is a big production machine. One, uh, thanks for the talk. And uh, one simple question: uh, When you talk about uh, support supporting uh, 200 gig, do you support 200 gig NRG or PAM4 or both? Just PAM4. Just PAM4. Yeah. So, but uh, if you support uh, PAM4, then you will waste half of your bandwidth. Uh, you waste half of bandwidth, or you split mm -hmm. two. If you split two, then you will hit the limitation of the number of logical. Yeah. Well, well, we won't necessarily waste half our bandwidth. We'd waste half our radix in the current strategy. Um, I mean, this isn't, again, like I, I mentioned that we're building for transitions. Like, maybe we have a 200 gig only mini pack in production, but this is mainly to give us flexibility for. Just for connectivity. Yeah, and then like maybe we'll get, you know, another more powerful chip someday. Exactly. The other thing is network transitions typically occur tier by tier. We just don't come and like four click the whole fabric. It's a gradual process of like the tiers like transition from one technology to another. And this is where this compatibility with multiple speeds and multiple interface times come into, comes into play mainly. All right, I think we're, uh, we've reached the end of the session. Uh, the keynotes are, are, are ramping up. So uh, again, thank you all for coming.